the Gospel of John. This will be our 70, 73rd exposition of this book. We're going to be in the 6th chapter, verses 14 through 17. The Gospels uh, affirm to us by example also that it's not enough to witness the working of the Lord. The works of God must be seen with eyes that are given to see. Yeah, that's right. And it's not enough to hear the very words of God spoken by the Son of God. It's not enough. They've got to be heard with ears mm -hmm. to hear. Mm -hmm. The ones who crucified Christ, calling for it, with zeal were the very same ones that heard his gracious works and seen his mighty works. Yeah. Heard his gracious words and seen his mighty works. So you've got to understand what you hear and perceive what you see. Yeah. Now, sound thinking is based on this layered foundation. Perceiving comprehending and, and hearing. Understanding what God has said and perceiving what He's done. Yeah. Amen. The uh, comprehension is built, mm -hmm. built on that. Without that foundation of thought, human assessment is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And human assessment is always wrong. Yeah. Because it's not high enough, see? It's not high enough. It's too low. And if a person doesn't uh, come into this where they understand and perceive, they'll fall into a theological ditch they can't get out of. Jesus is going to have to rescue them from it. And while Jesus is glad to do this, he doesn't get a whole lot of glory out of rescuing people out of the ditch that have been exposed to a lot of what he's done. That shows how great he is, but you don't want to try and exploit that yeah. Amen. at all. There's a reason why holy men of God prayed, Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. See, there's a reason why they said that. And why over and over they said, Give me understanding. Five or six times, 119 Psalms says it, give me understanding. What they said that, because these men of God realized you can't learn the things of God by academic studies. Mm -hmm. We're all for study, make no more. I'm a student yeah. myself. We're all for study. Mm -hmm. But they, they, all study has to be mixed with holy aptitudes. Yeah. They come from God. Now it's imperative that men understand, have a proper understanding of God, of Christ, and of God's eternal purpose in which salvation is worked out. They've got all those have to be, they have to be understood. Amen. And so uh, the Holy Spirit opens things up to us. Jesus teaches us. The Holy Spirit leads us. Why is all of that true? Because no one's going to get to heaven who remained in a state of ignorance here. Uh, I understand you can't build an institution on that. I, <laughs> I understand that. And I do not stand in admiration of institution builders. If you've ever been to any kind of a Christian convention, they honor these kind of people. Most always they're not people of understanding. Once in a while, in the old days anyway, they once in a while would someone with understanding would be there, but this is kind of rare today. So in these things that we understanding God, understanding Christ, understanding the purpose of God, 
when these aren't understood, sound doctrine cannot be preached. That's why men talk about things like the country, mm -hmm. marriage, yeah. being kind to your neighbors. Why do you think they talk? That's something that children understand yeah. for Pete's uh -huh. sake. That's right. Why do then men talk about that so much? Because that's all they have to talk about. Uh -huh. That's why. Yeah. But this hurts the people. And it, may, it forces people to wrong thinking and wrong conclusions. Now we're going to have an example of that right here in our uh, in our text tonight. John 6 verses 14 through 17. Remember Jesus had just fed the multitude. <coughs> then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into this under the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. Intriguing text. Yeah. Now we learn that the multiplication of bread and fish wasn't a private matter. This wasn't something done under the table. There were people that, that saw this. Yeah. Yeah. People that saw this. Now Jesus didn't always do that. When he would turn the water into wine, he didn't let everybody see that. Just the servants and his disciples knew that's all. But here is a case where he allowed others to see it. When he was transfigured, see, only three, only three. That's all it saw, only three. When he raised Jairus', Jairus daughter from the dead, only her parents, and Peter, James, and John, they're, they're the only ones that, that saw it. But then there's like the day of Pentecost. Everybody saw it, mm -hmm. see? That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. The healing of the lame man at the gate, beautiful. Everybody saw that, yeah. see? But see, this isn't the way with everything, but this is the way with some things. Those men who had seen the miracle. Now, John's the only writer that reports this incident. This refers to those who witnessed the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. That's the men, that's the people we're talking about. They saw and seen his miracle. Other versions, like the uh, New American Standard, says the people saw the sign which he had performed. In another version, uh, says the they, people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did. The NIV. Now, I'm interested to learn how they'll think. Or they saw a legitimate miracle, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. This is a legitimate, a very large miracle. Yeah. Five loaves and two fishes multiplied to feed 5,000 men beside women and children. And it was seen. All right, now what, what are people going to think? So John reports what these men said. This is, a, this is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Now to my knowledge, there's only one prophecy where the Messiah was called a prophet. These men, they, they knew it. Moses gave it. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet for the midst of thee and of thy brethren, like unto me, him, unto him shall ye hearken. I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command thee. Now let's, look, let's notice what Moses said about this prophet. He said, Unto him shall ye hearken. He's going to raise him up from among the brethren. He's going to be a, an in-house prophet. 
going to raise them up for in the in, among Israel. They're, they're going to be the ones that see this okay. prophet, the ones that hear this prophet. And unto him they would hearken. This is not a requirement. You ought to hearken. This was a prophecy. You will hearken. It's those who saw him for what he was. To him you shall hearken. Now, uh, Peter referenced this on the day of Pentecost, or when he talked to, this, to the uh, Jewish leaders. He said, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me him shall ye hear in all things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Him shall ye hear in all things that he shall say. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, you hearken. This is what is going to, going to happen. So right away we've 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 divided humanity. Right? That's right. <laughs> right away, we've divided humanity. There's those that hear Jesus, and there's those that don't. Yeah, amen. Yeah, there's some of them that don't are in the church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The those that hear Jesus, those that don't. Uh -huh. I don't think for one moment that God is going to bless somebody who mm -hmm. doesn't hear Jesus. Amen. Don't. don't yeah. Don't entertain such a thought. I'll raise him up from among you. And I'd send him unto you. And he, God said, I, I will put my words into his mouth. Israel, when God spoke, he spoke through an angel, actually, but they, they were scared. They were frightened. They didn't want to hear him speak anymore. God said, I'm going to put my words in his mouth. He's, he's going to say what I would say if you were facing me directly, put him in his mouth. And Jesus, when he came, he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. See, he, he told me, I'm the, I only say what God once said. So, so if Jesus pronounced a blessing, that's what God said. If Jesus cursed somebody, that's what God said. If Jesus said, Blessed are, that's what God said. If he said, you're cursed with a curse, that's what God said, see? Yeah. Amen. If he said, you ought to, mm -hmm. that's what God had said. If he said, why didn't you believe? That's what God had said, see? Yeah. He said what God said. Again, he said, uh, my father had taught me, as my father had taught me, I speak these things. So it's just a communication from God to men. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which has sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Mm -hmm. And as he told me the message and the words in which to deliver it, he told me both. That's, that's what I tell you. I t see, when you read, read the Sermon on the Mount, that's what God, mm -hmm. that's what God said. Amen. If you read his assessment of the churches in Revelation, that's what God said. See? I say that because, see, I, I really don't think a lot of professing Christians think of Jesus this way. Mm -hmm. But that's the way you've got to think of him. I'll put my words in his mouth, he said. And he'll speak all that I command him. not going to leave anything out. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. The words of Jesus are not partial. They're not fragmentary. They're not just introductory. That's right. <laughs> He's going to say all that I told him to say. Amen. You'll find that whatever anybody, else, any apostle taught or any other writer taught, it was it, it was in, it was included in what Jesus said somewhere. Yeah. He, he he addressed that subject yeah. somewhere. Uh -huh. And Jesus said, "My words will never pass away." Yeah. Amen. So He's pretty clear about it. And he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he, said, bring, he didn't say he'll bring to your remembrance Moses' words. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's not what he said. That's right. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll bring to your remembrance what the prophets said. That, he said, he'll bring to your remembrance what I said. Yeah. That's what he said. In fact, he said, he that hears you, hears me. He that despises you despises me. He that despises me despises him that sent me. So that goes right back to God. Yes. See? So that's, now, this is of concern when you realize how much of the Bible 
is not comprehended by vast portions mm -hmm. of the professing church, and furthermore, they're not even interested in it. Mm -hmm. Now this becomes an alarming mm -hmm. situation. Someone said, well, you know how we are. Yeah, that's what concerns us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now Peter elaborated on it. Moses said, whoever doesn't hear him, I'll require it of him. That's what Moses said. Here's how Peter, he, he expounded this in Acts 3, 23. Here's what God said to Moses. It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. All right, that's yeah. uh, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he elaborated on that. He said, It shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yeah. See, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty strong. Now, this is, this is yeah. the truth. Yeah, that's right. This is the truth, brethren. This is not... Uh, now, so far as human experience was concerned, the effectiveness of this prophet depended on whether you listened or not. Yeah, amen. That's right. If you didn't listen to this prophet, it didn't make any difference. Yeah. What's said about the grace of God and the love of God and the power of God, so it won't, it won't give you any advantage until you listen to Jesus. Amen. 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 It's a very unfavorable picture when someone hears the gospel yeah. oh. and yet they walk out unaffected by it. You know, and we want to be charitable and say, well, you know, maybe God will work with them. But see, this is not a good sign. Yeah. yeah. Everywhere in the Bible, when they heard and they believed, they were saved. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to show best I can tonight that mm -hmm. the idea that God will work with them, God's patient with them, that's something men said. That's, that's, that's right. not anything God said. That's right. God didn't say that. I'm going to wax bold and say, God didn't say that. Yeah. That's men saying that. That's right. And from our standpoint, from our standpoint, we, we do, we are called upon to be charitable. Yeah. But see, because we don't know everything. Yeah, but not to people that don't receive it. Uh, I, I, I in, in the common sense of the word, you I understand? Know what you're saying. Yeah. When, now, or, now here's what the, the men were saying. Yes. It says in times past, I believe this but now I command everyone everywhere to repent. That's, That's right. right. But that's God's, that's God's words. What I'm saying is, if a person hears the gospel, I see them walk out the door, I can't tell you they're going to hell. Oh, no. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, we don't know why that happened. But God does, and if a person does it, refuses to listen, and eventually, if you're around someone like this long enough, they can't hide it. But but you can't, uh, you're, you don't have to deter this. Is, you just tell people this. People have to be told this. Amen. That's right. That's what he's doing here. That's right. People had to be told this, look, this is a wide open door. Mm -hmm. The day of salvation is for you. But if you don't accept this, yes. <laughs> we'll pray for you and so forth and so forth. But if you don't accept this, the wrath of God's on top of your head. Amen. And every place you go, it goes. Uh -huh. That's how serious it is. Amen. And I, I think in our day this needs to be said yes. because there's been a kind of a mamby pamby cotton mouth approach to religion. Tone it down, act nice, smile all the time and all this, and it ain't working. That's right. Just in case anyone wonders. It's not working. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Well, it seems strange when a child, a physical child, doesn't grow up and we're all alarmed. But right. well, it just seems like it's a norm when a person in a crisis is like, oh, they're, they're starting their progression. And yeah. I mean, they, when they've been in the faith or so uh, for a long time, no. Just as our bodies are mm -hmm. expected to grow up mm -hmm. into young men and young women, and then to into maturity, so is our spiritual man. Oh, yes. to, I think the spiritual man actually grows faster than our physical oh, yes. one. It has yeah. to because yeah. we have something different in our uh, new man mm -hmm. than we've ever had in our, oh, yes. our yeah. just physical bodies, and so it's not only required and not only expected, but more so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Now, now here that is true, mm -hmm. but here we're not talking about growing. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're talking about hearing That's right. and listening, mm -hmm. which is the what stimulates mm -hmm. growth. Yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. see, if a person's not growing, it's because they're not listening. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Doesn't make any difference what they say. Just uh -huh. discard it. Yeah. Don't pay attention to it. Someone's not growing. 
And it's evident, mm -hmm. you, you be careful about prejudging something uh -huh. like this. Yeah. But if then, if in truth they aren't growing, it's because they aren't listening. That's right. They're listening to somebody else. There's only one other master to listen to. Uh -huh. right. Now, all right, uh, Jesus heard this. Quite a compliment it be to anybody else. How does he react to this? When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force and make him a king. What? He, he, saw, he saw why they were saying this. Right. They weren't saying this because thank God the, Moses, the prophet Moses prophesied here. That's not even what they were thinking. Uh -huh. They were thinking, this is our way out finally. See? Yeah. They weren't even thinking about what God sent Jesus to do. When he saw they would come and take him by force, he departed again to a mountain himself alone. This is how flesh is. It can never get further than here and now. That's, That's right. right. It That's just right. always thinks about That's right. It's never thinking about eternal life and what's going to happen. It's, uh, everything has to do with here and now. Yeah. Now, Jesus was moved by what he perceived, see? He did something. Yeah. He saw they were going to take him by force, and they were going to seize him and force him to be king. I don't know how they anticipated doing that, but that's what they were going to do. So he just left. Yeah. I'll be careful how I say this, mm -hmm. but... If Jesus detects you're trying to use him for some fleshly advantage, yeah. Yeah. he'll leave. That's right. Amen. He'll just leave. That's not what he's here for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may have some bad circumstances. I understand that. Yeah. I've had bad circumstances myself. I understand about that. Mm -hmm. But I also know that's not why Jesus came. That's right. Yeah. There's nothing Jesus can't address, yes. but it's why he came that we're talking about. The, the result of this, it, it, the, if you seriously are attempting to use Jesus for something other than what he came for, right. you won't even know he left. That's right. You'll think, well, he's still in, he's still, you'll pump yourself up and you'll be all excited. Jesus won't even be in the That's room. That's right. You're exactly right. When he perceived... On another occasion, well, Matthew says, uh, when they came to him and said, is it lawful for us to pay tribute to Caesar? It says, he perceived their craftiness. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they really weren't interested in yeah. whether or not to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. Matthew says, he perceived their wickedness. Another time when the disciples reasoned among themselves about his word, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It says Jesus perceived what they are reasoning and spoke to them about it. Once when some of his enemies re reasoned within themselves about him forgiving sin, Mark 2.8 says Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned. See, Jesus, and when, what Jesus sees determines what he does. Amen. Yes. you got to see this. It's important to see this. If he sees a tender heart and a sensitive ear, mm -hmm. he stays. Yeah. Yes. He ministers. Mm -hmm. If he sees disinterest, he leaves. Mm -hmm. And a person doesn't have access to him. That's right. Not even in their prayers. Yeah. Amen. Unless they repent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about this. Jesus knows what we think about him. Some people think he's a hard master because he does require a lot from those who follow him. But those who, those who do what he says find that it's not so hard after all. His yoke is easy and his burden's light. Yeah. They, find, they find it's not as bad as they thought at all. He knows what people think about his teaching. You know, Paul said to the Ephesians, If so be that ye have heard him and been taught the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. So he knows what we think about what he says. Yes, he knows it. 
The one, this one, this is one of the most contemptible things about the form of godliness that denies the power thereof. It puts a little value on Christ. And doesn't make much of listening to Christ and believing what Christ said and conforming to Christ's word. This is one of the contemptible things about a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. That the power thereof is the power that makes you godly. They reject yeah. the power God has supplied to make you godly mm -hmm. and they go about to establish their own yeah. righteousness. Now the text says, um, the, you, your religion must not be seasonal. Some people were willing to have a seasonal. Jews had seasonal religion. And it didn't do much for them. And some people submit to be dominated by powerless routines. They'll tell you that these routines really don't do anything. They really don't make them able. They don't impart any aptitude. We, we partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday, but it really not doing anything. See? Yes, it can come pretty close to home, let me tell you. But there's really no power in it. Why is that? Because they're not paying attention to Christ. And Christ makes us fully aware of these conditions. So they, he knew that they would seize him, snatch him away, come and carry him off by force. Now this is about a, a year and a half into Christ's ministry. Fairly early, but it's, he's seen it as already, he's getting ready now for the, for to yield up his life. He's already getting ready for this now, because some of the fervor is kind of dying down. It, it now appears as though Jesus of Nazareth fit their conception of the Messiah. But it, it was an improper perception. The new Isaiah prophesied, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness and rule in judgment. When they read that, they're thinking of overcoming mm -hmm. Nero. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. That's what they thought of when yeah. they said, That's not what the prophet was talking about. Yeah, that's right. there's, some pe there's some people he's reigning over that are in despotic, despotic political environments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bad, but Jesus is ruling right in the midst of his enemies. He's ruling there. So they, that's how they thought, so they, they thought this is the one that's going to rescue us at last from Roman tyranny. And then Jesus' own half-brothers, they, they thought this too. They were raised up with Jesus. Here's what they thought, his own half-brothers. They said to him, depart hence and go into Judea. You're, you're in the part that's not popular for us Jews, go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Mm -hmm. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do show these things, show thyself to the world. Mm -hmm. See? Get, get, let's get some advertisement out there. That's yeah. how they thought. Huh? Yeah. The scriptures say of his, his brethren, neither did his brethren believe on him. At this point, they didn't believe. Later, they came around, but they didn't believe at this point. So Jesus, knowing that this was a situation, it wasn't because he didn't have compassion. That wasn't why. It wasn't because he didn't have mercy anymore. That's right. Didn't have any more grace. That isn't why. He said, these people are disqualified. They're, dis yeah. they're disqualified yeah. from that. Because he's going to give you grace by you receiving what he does. Yeah. That's how you get the grace. Yeah. If you receive what he does and believe what he did and yeah. trust in him, uh -huh. then you get all these benefits. But if you don't, you don't get any of them. Amen. That's the way it is. So he departed again to a mountain himself alone. <laughs> that's, that's his reaction. It just kind of struck me. You know, as I, was, I was sitting there thinking about this. It struck me that he did that. Matthew gives us a little more detail about this. It says, Jesus straightway constrained his disciples to get into a ship. They just got through passing out all the food, yeah. and gathering up all the remains. Get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. 
And when the evening was come, he was there alone. That's Matthew's account. Mark says, Straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent the people away. When he sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. He adds that, he, to, yeah. to pray. So uh -huh. He had to refurbish himself, see? Yes. He'd been to this multitude of people. Uh -huh. He wrote a tremendous work that we talk about still to this day that showed the kind of Savior he is and so forth, but all of this had a depleting effect yeah. upon the Lord Jesus. He had to retire to be alone and be refurbished. It said he constrained his disciples. <laughs> it was with words that he did, I'm sure, but they had to get into a boat, leave this, whoa, look at this environment you've yeah. been in. You've been, before he fed the multitude, he'd been healing the sick, you know, healing the sick, a lot going on. Yeah. Then fed the multitude, then gathered up the fragments, and now get into a ship and go to the other sea. It's quite a, yeah. quite a change. But he didn't want them in that kind of environment. The multitude, and remember when he healed, virtue went out from him. The scripture says virtue right. went out from him and healed the people. So the Lord sends them ahead. He's sending them ahead to where he's going next, mm -hmm. see, which is uh, something he did. Now Jesus is found alone mm -hmm. in the mountain where he went to pray. No group of people around him. Mm -hmm. Matthew says he went up into the mountain apart to pray. Uh, just prior to the feeding of the 5,000, uh, uh, let me let me go back further. When Peter made the good confession, you remember in Matthew 16, a little early, it was earlier than this, but pretty close. Jesus had been praying. Uh -huh. Right after that, he went to Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. Jesus is praying. Yeah. Now here he is again. Mm -hmm. This all in a, in a kind of a tight time frame. He's praying, uh, praying again three times, praying relatively close together. So Jesus is approaching. The time when he's going to do what he came here to do. Mm -hmm. Lay down his life and take it up again. So he's building himself up for this mm -hmm. confrontation mm -hmm. of the powers of darkness that are going to be given a, a period of time to do the worst they can do. God's going to take the chains off of them and he can do whatever they want mm -hmm. for a, a, an hour, Jesus right. said. God's going to lay the iniquities of the world upon him. He's going to taste death. He's going to feel, he's going to feel the impact of iniquity. Yeah, amen. So he starts, he's praying more now. I don't know if I've seen it quite like this before, but you know, Jesus, he does all these miraculous things. But see, these were not impressive to Jesus. Yeah. These were actually depleting to him. Exactly. They were impressive to everyone else that is a man in common. That's all oh, this great supernatural stuff. But to Jesus to come down and to do something That's this right. mundane for deity, yeah, he's in this a, was depleting. He's in a body. Yeah. He's in a body. See? So he got weary. We know he got weary because it, sometimes it says he got weary. He had, had to sleep. Yeah. With well, this kind of stuff wore Jesus out. Uh -huh. Being around certain people mm -hmm. was wearing yeah. on Jesus. Well, you've experienced, I know you, yeah. you, many of you have experienced this. You've experienced it. You're around certain people, just mm -hmm. being around them wears you out. That's right. Mm -hmm. yep. Sometimes you just have to get away, say, excuse me. Yeah. Get away somewhere where you can refurbish your strength. Mm -hmm. See, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, they're intensifying their opposition now. Mm -hmm. Now they're more aggressive in seeking to kill him. So Jesus now, he's fortifying. Because yeah. when, when he's betrayed, they're going to be at the peak of their power. See? Mm -hmm. When Satan assaults Jesus, he's going to be at the peak of his power. Mm -hmm. Principalities and powers are going to be at the peak of their power when they come against yeah. Jesus. So Jesus is uh, arming himself for that. Something that we have no yeah. idea of how extensive that was. Now the scene changes. Jesus went up. Remember, he we learned from Matthew and Mark that he sent the disciples to, to go over the get in a boat, go to the other side where he was going, mm -hmm. to kind of get folk ready. When even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea, not into the sea, unto the sea, 
and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. We don't know uh, how far they were from the mount he was transfigured on, and the mount's never named, but we're not, we're not sure like how far they had to walk to get to the sea from there, and we're not uh, sure how, how long they waited for Jesus. But it had been, been a while. And they were probably tired. They'd been with Jesus in a long vigil. They were with him when he fed the multitudes. They, they distributed the bread. That must have been some task. They gathered up the fragments. That must have been uh, some task. But they had to now get in the boat and head for the, yeah. about, about 10 miles. About 10 miles across. And the scripture tells they rowed. Yeah. They weren't sailing, they were rowing. And I've never had to row 10 mile, but I, I have an idea with 12 men in a boat and rowing. I th could be kind of exhausting. They were headed across the sea and they were over to Capernaum. They head for Capernaum, which is to the immediate northwest of the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So they had to way up at the top of the Sea of Galilee, right on the northwest. That's where Capernaum was. It's a city where Jesus dwelt after he left Nazareth. Remember when after the, he was turned down at the uh, synagogue of Nazareth, he left Nazareth and took up headquarters in Capernaum. That's where he was dwelling. This city is mentioned 16 times in the scripture. Jesus' ministry there fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah found in, found in uh Quoted by Matthew in Matthew 4.13, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them that sat in the region of darkness of death, light is sprung up. Yeah. That's in the land of Zebulun, the way of the sea. That's the area. So Isaiah said that in this region that was sitting in darkness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is in Canaan, yeah. was sitting in darkness. We know from Christ's ministry that this place, the demons had invaded this territory. Yeah. Every place Jesus went, there were demon-possessed people. They were everywhere. Mm -hmm. Canaan, this is Canaan we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So they were sitting in great darkness. Mm -hmm. he, their religion was impotent. Yeah. Had no power at all. The doctors of the law couldn't do anything but talk. That's all they could do. And all of a sudden, here comes a shaft of light. Yeah. <laughs> springing up in that area. And even though they were noted for their unbelief and Jesus upbraided them for it, he went there again. I gather it was to fulfill further the prophecy of Isaiah. Capernaum, that's, it. that's, that's where Jesus taught on the Sabbath days. He taught in the synagogue there. That's where he healed a nobleman's son, you remember? which was his second miracle, John says. That's a city where a palsied man is let down through the roof. It was in Capernaum. This is where Matthew was called, Levi. He was called from this, when he was in the city of Capernaum. Jesus cast an evil spirit out of a man in Capernaum. A certain centurion sent to Jesus when he was at Capernaum pleading for his servants. He says there was a lot of activity went on in Capernaum. These people... These exceptional people which had faith and were blessed by Jesus are examples that we're talking about Levi and some of these other people. They're examples of people that Jesus found in a lost state. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. Shepherd going out to get the sheep. Uh -huh. That's what they're like. All right, now the scene shifts back. The disciples are in the sea, carrying out the command of the Lord. It was now dark. They're in a boat at sea, and it's dark. Other versions say already dark or getting dark. Darkness is set in. See, it's a, that's kind of not a comfortable situation. Matthew tells us the ship was now in the midst of the sea. All right, that's, that's roughly, there's roughly four miles from this shore, four miles from that shore. So they're in the middle of the sea. It's dark, 
And there they sit. I know it's sit there rowing out there. Maybe you've experienced something like that in your life. You find yourself in the midst of the sea, mm -hmm. and it's dark. Yeah. <laughs> you can turn back to this account. Uh -huh. Jesus isn't going to leave him there. The middle of the sea, darkness all around. Mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of unplanned things. This is how they leave you. Yeah, that's right. That's how they leave you. Kind of experiences after high mountain top yeah, experiences. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. There may be a number of reasons why God does something like this. One, it'll keep you humble. Mm -hmm. And another thing it'll do, it'll test what you saw when you were on a mountain. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's true. Amen. Yeah, it'll tell you how profitable it was when you were up there. And it says Jesus wasn't wasn't come to them, not he hadn't come to them. Other versions say Jesus had not come to them, Jesus had not yet come to them, and still Jesus had not yet come back to them. So there's a variety of ideas about what this means. Some feel that John is saying Jesus hadn't come down from the mountain yet, so they just took off without him. That's that's what some say. Pulpit commentary says that. Some, some say the uh, text means that they expected him to come to them while they were while they were rowing over there, but he hadn't come yet. Some say that that's the idea. Myself, I think this is a backward view. He's it's not a sequential view. It's a backward view. He's telling you that. They knew Jesus eventually was going to be with them. They didn't really know if it was going to be in the boat or on the shore. They, right. they didn't know. But they were they were alone. That was the point. They were alone. Yeah. Their situation was uncertain. Mm -hmm. The only thing that could retrieve them is faith, and their faith wasn't really a, very strong at this point. Mm -hmm. Some of these disciples were seasoned seamen. They were used to being on the water. Yeah. Yeah. They must have known before they struck out it was going to get dark before they got to the other side. Right. I mean, I can't admit because it was evening when they yes. it was late when they left. Uh -huh. But see, Jesus had said, "Get in a boat and go yeah. to the other yeah. side." So yeah. the conditions weren't conducive to doing that uh -huh. from an earthly point of view. But they they did it anyway. Uh -huh. They got in and did it. Now, it seems to me that, that kind of mindset, that's got to get a hold of us all at some point. This has got to happen. You do it just because Jesus said to do it. Yes, you may yes. not see any other reason for doing it. There is, uh -huh. There are reasons, uh -huh. but you may not see other reasons. But if Jesus said do it, just up yes. and do it. Amen. Yeah, Brother Gibbon, I, I've often thought about this, that, that one of the things that may have been motivating them, and this is just my perception, is that Jesus would be waiting for them on the other side. He said, go to the other side. Yeah, it could have been too, and, yes, that's and right. And so, I mean, some of these, you're right, some of these, they've mm -hmm. been on this, they've been on this body of water a lot. They yeah. know this water. But they're, if it had been me, Jesus says, go, go, get over to the other side. I'm expecting, I'm yeah, going to see him. him to see I, did, I wouldn't be expecting, because I, I don't think it had ever happened before, that Jesus would meet him in the middle. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I would have well, thought that. Well, he hadn't done it before, but, yeah. <laughs> but sure. he, he's going to do that, but, but still... I can see them being filled with some kind of anticipation for Jesus. You know, this kind, this kind of obedience and devotion yes. can't be developed in the classroom. Uh -huh. you, don't read, you don't read yourself into this kind of frame of mind. This is not how it happens. Mm -hmm. This happens by exposure to yes. Christ. And you're around Jesus long enough you begin to pick up right. on certain things. Amen. That Jesus is not erratic. He's not no. doesn't have ups and downs. He's not, he's not mm -hmm. that way. And uh, every that time he said something, it happened. You know, if he commanded something, it happened. You pick up. You spend enough time around Jesus. You 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 don't doubt his word. Amen. You just don't do it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Subjection is. 
set before them in the flesh. In Christ, Jesus lived subjection out. There, you saw it mm -hmm. in Him, and then He'd tell you, I only do what I see the Father doing. He'd, yeah. he'd tell, yeah. I only say what the Father told me to say. So He'd, he'd tell you why yes. He did what He did. He was, it was disobedience to the Lord. So I think that uh, time spent with Jesus is never wasted. Amen. That is, this is now the kind of life which we have been brought to by the grace of God. Where the life of Christ is made known in our mortal flesh. Well, let me read it. The life also of Jesus made manifest in our body, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. Yeah, All right. See, so you might have made the mistake of saying, don't look at my flesh, whatever that, just exactly what does that mean? Uh -huh. I'm saying, you should say, look at my flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Your flesh is your mortal body at this, in this context we're talking about Amen. here. So if, you, if, if, if you're something that's not seen in your body, that's, that's a delusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just a delusion. Jesus lived this out, see? Yeah. Jesus lived this out. Amen. So people see that we can live it out. And, and to me, I love to hear about it because it, there's, a, there's a note of challenge and yeah. exhortation to it. Mm -hmm. It says, as he is, mm -hmm. so are we in the world. See, there it is. Yeah. And uh, you'll find yourself having no trouble with Jesus' commandments when you live like this. Yes. And the impact of this on tender hearts, you can't read people's hearts, but there's people out there that are really looking for somebody like this. They just have never seen anyone like this. And if they can see it in you, that you're living for a different reason, there's a different reason why you're living, and they can see it in you, they're more apt to listen to what you say. Amen. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm going to end there. I uh, I was a little bit, got a little confused in preparation. <laughs> and I, I rewrote last week's lesson from scratch. And I kept thinking while I'm writing it, I, I, I think when I was, I thought that must have been when I was in Luke. I got done and said, I did, I've already covered this. I had to, then I had to, Go back and start from stress, but it was uh, everything was clear in my mind when I did. <laughs> you know, really given a, a good example of this Jesus living it out. We just witnessed here just recently, Sister Katie standing before that That's judge. Right. See, the, if right. he had seen someone that was contradictory with her body, then her words he would have never listened to her. Yeah. But see, he saw, he, 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 you can see this That's in right. people. You know, you can see their the way their mannerisms. Christ is dominating in them. He's living in them. And this is not something that a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Cannot be hid. And so yeah. this, is, this is something that, that we all have an opportunity yeah. to live out the life of Christ. Now, obviously, it's not going to be to his measure, but it is going to be to our measure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let your light. Yes. Amen. So shine. So, so he tells them, so they can see your good works. That's right. Amen. See, he, he tells you what it is. Yes. And glorify God, which is in heaven. Now, they're glorifying God in heaven maybe by rejecting you. That, that may glorify God. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it will not be because of you personally. Amen. See? Amen. Anyone else, Brother Ricky? Yeah. Part of that text, humble yourselves yeah. in the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Two times. Yes. And Jesus lived that out in his earthly ministry. He sure did. Amen. It's like a temptation. Amen. I'm not saying he was tempted. because It doesn't say he was tempted here, but I can see... The device of the enemy. Oh, yes. He was sent by God into the world to humble himself, not to exalt himself. That's yeah. right. Yeah. He did not come to be served, but to serve. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so this is how the devil is with us too. We have to we have to be patient and wait for the time in which God chooses That's to exalt right. us. And up to that time we just humble ourselves and and, and seek to do his will. But Satan That's sent right. us in that way. Amen. Then, then God exalted him when his time came, and he'll exalt you when your time yes. 
In due time, he'll exalt you. That's the way it works. Anyone else tonight? All right.